you are live. There's a hyena. Everybody, hello, good morning. Welcome to the Dawn Safari here. Wild Earth we are. There is another hyena coming running past us. We bring you to the place this morning where Karula had her kill today. As we got here, these pilfering scavengers stole the kill. They've gone off up here. We have no idea where the cubs are, but we have seen Karula. She's been kind of following the hyenas, thinking about obviously stealing that kill back again. We don't know where the cubs are at this stage. We're keeping an eye out. It's all rather confusing. Anyway, welcome to it. My name is James Henry on Cameras VM. It's a bit of a frenetic start today as we try and figure out what on earth is going even before the sun has come up over the eastern horizon. Please send us your questions and comments as we go. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. It's a quite cold morning, 12 degrees Celsius, which I think is, what's that, Kirsten, about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe. 54. Goodness gracious, it's cold. I'm going to... Hyenas had got hold of the babies because they were sitting around here just sniffing the ground. There's nothing there though, so I think that's not an eventuality we have to worry about just yet. It's always going to be a worry though. Watch out there, VMP. It is quite thick in here, everyone, and we'll come back towards the area and see if we can find the cubs shortly. We're just going to drive up through here first, though, and see if we can find mum, and see if we find the hyenas. A fairly large branch, that. Not sure we'll get over it. There we go. Well done, everyone. Hold on tight. And I'm just keeping an eye on the trees behind us, because the cubs did go into the trees behind us earlier yesterday. Here's the leopard. right past us. She's obviously given up on her kill. That's Karula, everybody, 12-year-old queen of Juma. Good morning, madam. And hello, Hayden Turner. How wonderful to hear your sultry voice in my ear again. Hayden Turner, all the way from Taronga Zoo in Australia. It's lovely to have you with us here. You're most welcome, of course. Certainly one of your favourite animals just walking behind us. It's good to see you. And I believe we're going to be talking to you again fairly soon, which is marvellous news. And that we may even be lucky enough to see you at some stage this year. I can't see nothing, Viam. <laughs> you mean that stuff? Yes. Right. <laughs> Hold on, everybody. This is going to be a bit of a bump. <laughs> there we are. All right, while we get out of here, let's head across to the irascible Brent Leo Smith. I think he's looking for lions this morning. And that way you'll probably make less of a mess with your drinks. We'll see you shortly. Good morning and welcome to a chilly safari live this morning. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Brian Joubert and the thumb on camera with me. And of course, Brian does none of the operation of the camera. It's all the thumb. But sometimes when Brian and I are together, we're known as the killer bees. So hopefully we can bring you some killer bee magic on this sunrise safari. And I am in search of some Inkahuma lionesses. They crossed to the west yesterday. I heard some alarm calls in this area, but we, when we had a look, we couldn't see anything. And you can never trust a male impala at this time of the year. And uh, I'm hoping to see if there's any tracks of lions crossing back. If not, I'm going to head back up to the northern edge of our traverse zone and I'm going to go look for a favorite leopard of mine, Gajima. Now he's obviously called Kajima because he doesn't like cars and he runs away. But uh, we've had some success in habituating him in the last while. So always looking for a chance to see that beautiful male leopard who I like to call the ghost from the north. Uh, but we're going to look for the lions first. I'm just going to check from here down towards Impala Plains, see if we get any tracks. Those alarm calls were in this little river system or little drainage line as we call at the base of this hill and this is a prime zone for leopard and lion crossing there's water 
uh, to the west of us. So they do sometimes sneak through. And uh, I am hoping that it might not be lions and it might be shadow. I cannot wait to get the first visual of her cub. Very exciting. But she is be, has been way down south uh, in near the Londolozi boundary, uh, sharing a kill with Tingana, who's the dominant male leopard throughout this area. So Shadow is only really in our western sectors, and she's Karula, the leopard you've already seen this morning's daughter. Now, Karula holds the core territory over most of Juma, and then to the west, we've got one of her daughters, Shadow, and to the east, another Tandi. So we are hoping that we will be able to find you more than one leopard and a lion or two on this sunrise safari. And also, oh, there we go. I think those wildebeest and impala might have spotted some in Kahuma, ladies. Now they're going both ways, the tracks here. I'm just going to have a quick look. I think there's tracks going out, out, out. Are from yesterday morning. So we're not going to look at those. Waste of time, not fresh. I'm going to carry on, see if we've got tracks coming in. For every set of tracks that comes out, we've got to have one that comes in. And uh, no point in us being negative Nellies. Look where we are. And speaking of leopards and cats and whatnot, let's go back to Commander Bond, who's with the Queen of Juba. Okay, we found her again, everybody, and just behind her is at least one cub. Here comes the cub, just behind her, Viam. There it is. There we go. So we won safe. Don't know who that is at this stage. I'll try and figure it out now. Let's just watch carefully as she pops out. I'm going to talk as quietly as possible. I can hear calling, it's going, but that sounds like it's coming from a different place from where the little one is. They are, I think they're both fine. Look, 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 look. Oh, precious. Isn't that wonderful? The other one is fine, I can hear it calling. I'm just going to call this in on the radio. Oh, wonderful. Okay, now we need to get sight of the other one. Now we're going to follow, we're going to follow at a distance. Oh, I don't hear the other one anymore. I thought I heard a call from over here. Just, just keep looking in the trees. I'm going to follow her, everybody, but I don't want to get between her and another one. There, they're both there, they're both there. Yay! They're both there, everyone. Let's just stop here and we'll get a view of both of them. Ah, oh, this is wonderful stuff. She's just calling them, making that chuffing sound. Film, did you see both? I did. Okay. Wonderful. There, 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 running up behind. <laughs> Isn't this too special? Two days in a row, we are so lucky, everybody. So, so lucky. I'd love to try and make out that this was some sort of skill of my own, but it isn't. I'm going to sneak up behind them.
And Sarah, you've interpreted the behavior we saw there completely perfectly. Her rubbing up against the branch there was absolutely territorial. It's exactly what was going on. I'm just gonna, we're going to keep our distance because we don't want to frighten the little ones. They have been a little nervous of vehicles, but there's a little bit of play behavior going on here. Stations, both youngsters are now on site, but they are all mobile in a southerly direction through the block. I know this isn't the best view, everyone. Yeah, probably Gary main. So I'm sure you're just as relieved as Viam and I are that these cubbies are okay. So special. Just ease around the mound here so we can get a view. She might just sort of start to rest here, but she looks like she's heading south of the reserve. We're getting quite close now. Let's stop here for a second, and we'll just let VM film her going. Uh -huh. Look, and see how perfectly they camouflage they are in this sort of dappled winter vegetation. Now, we're quite close to the southern boundary, everyone, so it's, I think, I mean, her want has been to go down, come, you know, she comes onto Juma, she kills something, they eat it, and then she disappears off towards Little Gauri, which is the reserve to the south of us. So it looks to me like that's exactly what she's doing again here. Oops, that was a very loud bang, wasn't it, Viam? Yes. Does it break your ears? Shocked you, no? It shocked you, dude. <laughs> the um says he's traumatized. All right, so, I mean, there's obviously a balance to be had here. I do, we don't want to frighten them, so we're not going to get a great view as long as they're moving. We're going to keep our distance, just as basically we're going to keep them in, in eye, eye distance. And then if they go into an open area, we'll get a nice look at them. Because obviously, the noise that you are hearing from the vehicle is certainly amplified by the microphones, but we're not quiet. I mean, we try and be quiet, but it's very difficult. A nice shot of them. <laughs> and Amy, you're all the way in Nova Scotia. Wonderful to hear from you. Thanks for talking to us. You want to know at what age they're not going to be in danger anymore from hyena. Amy, they're going to be in danger for the rest of their lives, but they're certainly out of the worst of it. I'd say that the danger that they face at the moment is exponentially less than it was, say, two months ago. Uh, but until they are actually established in a territory of their own, you know, they're always going to be face danger from many other animals. No, I think I've got us stuck. Hold on, another big bump coming. This is the most irritating stump in the world. There we go, we're over it. So they're all still just wandering up there. And it is going to get very thick in here. So we are going to keep our distance, so I'm not sure what kind of a view we're going to have. We'll do our best, won't we, Vivian? We want to try and go under this thing. I don't think they're going to go through the strip. Let's try and lift this over. Watch your heads, everyone. What do you think? Isn't that exciting? Both cubs made the night and I hope you had some great visuals with Chad. 
we've done a big leap. We haven't found any tracks yet. So I think we're going to abandon the fact that the Impala are a little bit testosterone crazed at the moment. And we're going to head towards the northern edge of the traverse and start heading east. And if we get no luck in that area, we may or may not shoot down towards Cheetah Plains. But let's have a look. I'm just going to have one last look. This is the area where the Impala and Wildebeest were looking at and snorting. I was really hoping it was going to be those Inkahuma ladies. But alas, and I was also looking for my side-striped jackal friends. So, just listening to the game, bro. Ah, so update on the Birmingham boys, ones that we can get. Uh, three of them were on a buffalo kill with uh, one in Kahuma Linus, the one who's got cubs in Torchwood at the moment. And now there's still one on the carcass, and then the others look like they might be heading west towards us. So we are heading in that general direction. They are still off our, our Travis area at the moment, but uh, Andrew can hear them roaring towards Cheetah Cutline. So for those of you who hear me talk about Cheetah Cutline, it's, uh, it's our eastern edge of the Traverse. Uh, we're going to make our way there, and I was really hoping to see a little curled up side stripes jackal this morning and we have been seeing them regularly over these open areas around sandy patch and this is sandy patch you can see it's quite sandy but also if you are new and you've just stumbled across this and wondering what strange thing is going on here you're joining us on a live african safari and we are in search of not only the big aries and scaries but all the little fluffies and featheries as well. And uh, if you want to ask us a question about where we are, what we're doing, you can do that with the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. But quickly back to that female leopard. Okay, here we go, everybody. We've managed to get into a place where they are just trotting behind mum. That's the, I can't see which one that is. Looks like the young male. Mum's just in front with the daughter. So Charlotte and the Queen in front and they're heading towards the southern boundary we've come through the sort of thickets there we're coming up onto the ridge crest and that is indica indicated by that marula tree there that big sort of deadish tree in front of you and I'm just going to stop here we've got a view there uh, quite a lot east of that taxi went directly south from where she had the kill Isn't that wonderful? This is just great. Here comes the sun starting to come up. Beautiful. Oh, all three of them. <laughs> Fantastic. elegantly ducked underneath that branch which we will then crunch over no doubt I'm hoping they're gonna stop everyone but I think she's gonna keep moving south but at least we've had some time with them and most especially at least they are safe and sound Tax, if you come east and then switch off, you'll hear me coming through the block. So we're just trying to help Tax and get into the sighting. I'm going to take a gamble here. I'm going to make a gamble and go around to where the termite mound is in front of us. Let's see if they don't go towards that. They often use them as vantage points. And we'll get them with the rising sun. There we go. <laughs> They've stopped moving. This is too wonderful. 
attacks. They've stopped moving now. So maybe come north. Dara, you're in Ohio as we watch this absolutely incredible scene unfolding in front of us. And you want to know, do the cubs have the instinct to climb a tree? Yes, absolutely they do. They learn that instinct very quickly when they're young. Well, they don't learn it. They have it already in them as they're born. Anything unfamiliar they will move away from, they will try and get away from. Well, quickly, Brent's got something fascinating to show you. So we managed to catch up with the little side stripe jackal pair and they really look like they're setting up territory here in this area. And quite often we see them as little fluff balls, but at the moment they're foraging. And the side stripe jackal has a far, far more varied diet than the black back jackal. They eat termites and fruit and all sorts of things outside of meat. I wonder what they found there. Let's just go see. These two are quite relaxed compared to some of the ones we see, so we're going to try to get a little bit closer. And I'm just double checking down there, making sure there's nothing at Sydney's water hole. Like they've found something there. You know what? Oh. So they could be foraging for insects in that leaf litter. <laughs> Look at them, they've got nice full bellies, so they've obviously been doing well. Here we go, it's eating something out of that leaf litter. Could be termites. They are such gorgeous little canids. Okay, quickly back to that theme of uh, to Karula. Oh, we have been blessed again, everybody. Here they are. They haven't moved from where you were. She's just been giving them a bit of a bath. Isn't that wonderful? You can hear them just squeaking at her every so often. This is too special for words. Hey? Isn't that wonderful? That little thing looking at us. Well, there's another vehicle coming in. Look at the colors as they move through that winter vegetation. Golden leaves and little golden leopard. I'm just gonna sit here and wait and see if they don't pop out there. Has she walked past that thicket? No, there she is, here she comes. Let's just wait here, everyone. There she comes. See, they can see the other vehicle now, you can see. They're looking up, but they're not afraid. They're definitely not afraid. Okay, now, let's try and move around. They've gone sort of around taps, and they're a good distance from us now, about 50 meters, so it doesn't make too much difference if we make a little bit of noise as we go through here. They're not too far from the southern boundary. I don't think we're going to get through that way, not without destroying something. So while Tax has got them in sight, we'll take a slightly easier route around this way. Liam, of course, has lost two teeth and one eye during the course of this morning's chase. My apple. And your apple. Did you lose your apple, Liam? That's dreadful. Now you've created an alien invasion of invasive vegetation. Your reckless driving. It's not my reckless driving. It's your terrible picnic skills. There they are, I can still see them. 
Now, Christopher, we're going to stop over here and just wait for her to come past. I think she's going to come past us on this game path here. You want to know why we call big cat youngsters cubs and not kittens? Um, Christopher, I think it's purely an English language convention. I don't think it's got anything to do with biology. Uh, it's just an English language convention. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why it should be that way. I think it's just to differentiate them. Interestingly, they do come from different genera. So the cats, the, you're right, the cats um, from the small genus Panthera, at least from the big cat genus Panthera. That one's carrying something. Carrying something? Yeah. Oh, yes, look. It's got something to eat. Well, they're called cubs, Christopher, but the youngsters from the genus Felis, which your domestic cat comes from, well, they all called kittens, so servals and caracals, and small spotted cats, etc. We go down into this. Um, go down into this quarry. This is beyond special. Yet again, the queen delivers us a magnificence. Where is she, Vian? I think she went along the top. Oh, there she is. She's just over there with the babies. <laughs> what a joy. Any idea what the cub is eating there? Can't really see. This is just wonderful. We are so lucky. You hear that? So we're not, we're now only about 20 meters or so from the boundary, everyone. So what we're going to do, I think, is probably move, oh, the cubs have disappeared in an opposite direction. That's interesting. I think they, you said they're a little bit reticent about the vehicles. So she's come, oh, oh yes. Oh yes, come on, just stay right there. They're so close in front of us now, everyone. Let me just quickly tell Tex. Where's my radio? Oh, this is unbelievable. Tex, they're in the quarry here. This is a rare, rare joy. Not even looking at us. There's just a little bit of sound from the morning, otherwise it's very silent, you know. Jen, you ask a very valid question about whether or not Karula has got sufficient territory to hand over to the daughter when the daughter becomes adult? And the answer is yes, because, well, her territory is huge. And, I mean, it's completely normal that she will, you know, she'll change the territory size as the cubs get younger. 
at least get older. And, you know, the, 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 while they're not fluid, I mean, leopard territories are certainly not fluid. They are certainly fluid enough for her to be able to make sufficient, you know, concessions to the youngster when it gets older, as she did with Tandy, as she did with, um, with Shadow. Let's move around. Ease around here. You can still see them both. And this is going to be probably the last view we get of them, everybody, as they disappear off to the south. Just listening to Cedric, everybody, he's just saying there that they saw a shadow yesterday. He's saying that to his guests, and he's just mentioning, of course, that Karula is the grandmother of the little cub that they saw yesterday. interesting. I'll have a look with my binoculars. Brenda, you say that the little male's tail looks whiter to you on the back. Um, I think it might just be a trick of the light, to be honest, Brenda. Can you see any difference, Gimpy? Which one's the male? I actually can't see at the moment. What a relief that they're all okay. That's it, just sit down there, chap. That's the female in front there. You can see her those eyes are an unbelievable colour. That little little <coughs> sound they make is so amazing. There's a, there's the little male. Brendan uh, oh yeah it is it is, you know. It is a little bit cleaner white at the end of his tail, I think, than hers. That's a very good point. I would agree with you. Whether that's because it's just dirtier or not, I don't know. But he's definitely more nervous than she is. Okay, a last view, everyone. As they disappear off into Hoffman's, where, of course, Shadow is. Shadow is not far from here. Inside there, she was with Tingana, and she's got a kill. go across the road. What a stroke of luck this has been. So, I mean, that, that Impala kill was stolen from her as we arrived. The hyenas came in, pinched it. Those cubs obviously skedaddled and very cleverly in the right direction, no doubt. And that, I'm afraid, everyone, is going to be that. Well, there's one last view. I think it's so interesting, you know. I mean, we're basically, she's on the corner of Tundi and Shadow's territories. So she's taken refuge almost within their territories. Now, I wonder if there isn't some element of seeking out the security of family and the fact that you know, familiar leopards are unlikely to be a threat to her. I think it's really interesting because we're, I mean, her, the bulk of her territory is normally north of this road. She's going into sort of, the, yeah, like I say, the overlapping corner of Tundi and Shadow's territories. And that, we're just going to watch them. They are still moving down through there. Just see them moving there. Can you see them, Vim? You can just see the spots moving through the bush. There we are. And of course, well within inside uh, the male leopard's territory, inside Tingana's territory, who has fathered at least 
two litters and quite possibly soon Tandy's litter. We'll just wait here for one second, everyone. I just want to see if they don't pop out there. I think that's it. We've got them. Well spotted, Jim. Just little leopards running away. <laughs> uh. All right, I'm just going to call this in. Sorry, the radio is still yakking about some lions that they've been found. All right, let's head across to Brent, find out what he's doing, and I'll catch up with you just now. So we. Checking very carefully along the northern edge of our traverse. So we've had a female lion track. So I've called Herbert and he's going to go have a walk on there and so we can keep checking further. So that male lion that's been roaring is probably beyond that crest there, but it does sound like he's coming west towards us. So fingers crossed, it's gonna be incredible to have one of those beautiful Birmingham boys roaring in this early morning mist. Of course, if you don't know who the Birminghams are, they're our dominant male lion coalition in this area. And our dominant female pride is called the Inkahuma pride. And uh, at the moment, two of them, we're certain, have cubs. We know for sure one's got three cubs, and she's got a den in Torchwood, which is just outside. The other one is actually denned inside Juma. But we've zoned that area for now, and also she's almost in an inaccessible a river system with massively high walls. It's a really good place to keep those cubs safe. Unlikely hyenas are going to wander in there too much. And uh, she, her tracks are coming in and out of there constantly. So we're just going to leave her be for a little while. But I'm hoping that that male lion makes an appearance on that crest right there. We are going to take a little gander towards the Buffles Hook waterhole, see if there's anything there. As we know, as we head deeper and deeper into the strat, every little bit of water becomes more and more important. Of course, a much love lion to all our viewers is Junior. Now, Junior is the now independent male from the Inkahuma Pride, and he's been living quite a lonely existence for the last while, but he's recently formed a coalition with a, another male that we think comes from the Manuleti. Now, John in California was wondering if I had any updates. Unfortunately not, John. I haven't heard anything further. He hasn't been seen in a day or two. Uh, the last, I think they might have headed into the Manuleti, uh, into that southern section of the Manuleti. But as soon as I hear something, I will let you guys know. Okay, so we're about to arrive at the water hole. Brian, predictions? Hippo. Hippo. Brian thinks we're going to see a hippo. I'm hoping for a male lion, but I'm the eternal optimist. Instead, there's a hippo running across the road. There we go, Brian is correct. Now, this hippo can be a little bit grumpy. He's given us a snort or two in the past. He's, you know, there's that large backside. We're not gonna get the best view, I'm afraid. And we're definitely not going to push him. He, has, he is a bit grumpy and uh, a lot of stress at the moment due to the drought. Very little water left. So quite often you're finding these young hippo bulls or old hippo bulls 
are being pushed into the little remaining bits of water that they wouldn't normally be in. And the big remaining bits of water are where the dominant males uh, with all the lady friends are staying. And you can see, not much here at the moment, except for a little three-banded plover down on the water's edge closest to us. And a herbert who's on his way to go look at those lion tracks. Here we go, look at that. Isn't that a gorgeous little bird? Morning, Herb. Hi, Yungfo. Any Yungkons? Uh, there's mm, lots of Yungkons up and down around Sydney's. Yeah, some of it goes into the, into the block between Aubrey's and Sandy Patch. Pongala, yeah. I think it's someone site who's been staying in um, Gari, Gari drainage line. There we go, Herb's going to go check for us. There we go, look at this little plover as he moves along the water's edge. So you're generally only going to find three-banded plovers on the edge of the water. So Kim in South Carolina said, James stacked rocks on the edge of the Buffles Hook waterhole uh, to see how fast it was dipping. Brian, were you with James? Nope. Uh, Brian and I weren't there. Now, the one problem with stacking rocks on the edge of a waterhole like this is if you might have noticed while we were looking at that little bird, the plethora of elephant excrement that is there. So they might have knocked it over. Um, maybe it was on the other side, so let's go have a look. Uh, so, and Kirsten and Violent Control also wasn't there when it was done, so I'm not sure exactly where the rocks are stacked, but it doesn't look to be this side. So let's have a look on the other side. And I'm very happy for all of you out there, but very jealous of that Karula sighting you had this morning in this golden light. So we've just seen that hippo disappear out of here and head off into the bush. I think those could be the rocks. You think those are the rocks, Brian? Maybe. It looks like they might have been kicked over. Well, Kim, let me know if those are the rocks. Um, but in the meantime, Betty's wondering uh, about the hippo that stays in the Juma pan all night. Where does he go during the day? So this isn't nearly deep enough for a hippo. So you might find this one's coming, got a bit of moisture on his skin. Now, there's a very steep little river system behind this, this, this water hole. And uh, I've actually on foot found him sleeping in there. So he goes and finds a deep bit of shade and he rests in there. And uh, that's due to the fact that if he had to stay in the water hole or the Juma Dam pan, probably get very sunburned. So they spend time in thickets, uh, normally in dry riverbeds where there's a lot of shade where the evergreen, evergreen trees are. And I'm not sure whether those are the rocks Ah, those are the rocks. Um, I just got an update from James who says he put them uh, there, but unfortunately they are no longer a good gauge because the elephants have kicked them over. So they're actually probably closer to the water than they were. So we're going to keep moving on. I've been trying to give that male lion enough time to sort of meander this way. But we all know lions are lazy creatures and uh, he's probably stopped for a snooze on his march. So, 
we're talking a lot about predators and obviously we aim to spend as much time with them as possible. And uh, Sham Sung is wondering, do they get their moisture content from their kills? So, yes and no. So lions and leopards are not water dependent. Uh, in very arid areas such as the Kalahari, uh, they do get most of their, their water from their kills. But if there is water available, they will drink. So here, the, you could say the lions and leopards and the Sabi sands are, are pretty water dependent. And there's enough water around that they never have to go without. But in other parts of Africa, uh, lions and leopards can go through the whole a dry season without drinking. But if there is, they choose to drink. There's a few other animals we get out here that are not water dependent. And the most common of those that we see is the Stenbok. A very pretty little antelope that is one of the more common smaller species we see on the live drives. And they get their water content from the dew in the morning. They also are able to dig out uh, little tubers from different plants and grasses and obtain moisture from there. And we've actually been lucky enough to watch one do that. It's, oh dear, I think I forgot my hat again. Silly me. And I don't even have Jamie's to borrow. Okay. I'm just going to jump on the game drive radio quickly. See where Andrew, how far from our boundary Andrew thinks that male line is. Andrew, Andrew. Andrew, how far from Cheetah Cut Line do you think that uh, Ngala was calling? Kobe, thanks very much. Well, while we continue our search for the biggest cat that's out here, James has got the biggest animal. Yes, it is big, everybody. Elephant cow, now mobile towards us in a stately fashion. She seems to be fairly relaxed, though. Well, she's got two colleagues or mates through there to the right hand side that are having a bit of a box with each other, looks like two young bulls. And she's just come round here to have a little check of us out, see that we're not up to any, up to no good. I'd just like to try and move so we can get slightly into a position where you can see these two youngsters having a fight, which is very funny to watch. I don't want to get too close to her and frighten her. Um, let's do this. In fact, it's not. They're going to come out there. Are they then? Are they going to come out? Maybe. Maybe not. Not likely not. And there's seven mines. Let's just ease forward here. There we go. That would be much better. We'll have a better idea here. quite close, so I'm just moving very slowly. Yeah, that'll give us an idea of the extent of the herd here. Very relaxed they are at this stage. And she's looking out, she's seeking out what looks like small knob fawn seedlings that are growing in the shade there and she's very specifically feeling them out, breaking them off and devouring the entire thing. Did you hear that? I'm, I'm often not sure if you can hear what we can hear. She made a very distinctive rumble, the, the vocal rumble that they make. 
It sounded like it sounded like a helicopter in the distance. I'll sneak slightly forward again, except check these two out here. They're having a bit of a box. A youngster just trying to get in on the action with a slightly older one. And <laughs> being reversed into. Oh, fantastic. I've said this before, but when I watch elephants, I just cannot help but make parallels with human beings. I find their behavior so often so similar, especially in terms of age. There's a big bull coming this way, Vian. A very big bull coming from the left there. Well, I don't know if he's very big, but he's not small. And often bulls will be trailing the herds. Now, Samsung, you ask a very good question as to whether elephants ever fall through the termite mounds when they climb them. Yes, they can, I suppose. Not through. You know, termite mounds are not hollow. Termite mounds are pretty much solid, and so, yes, while they might crush them slightly every so often, they certainly don't um, fall through them. So Samsung, normally the termite mound will sort of hold them up, but they're not hollow in, in the middle. What a joyful elephant sighting. Now, everybody, we're on Arethusa, and we've come to Arethusa for a specific reason, haven't we, Liam? Yeah. We have reports that our old pals, the uh, not, so, uh, not so courageous Matimbas, are here on a buffalo kill, and with any luck, we'll be able to go and see them fairly soon. But I think there are a few vehicles in that sighting at the moment, so let's just enjoy these elephants for now. So that will be very interesting to see how they're doing. Big fat lumps, they've been eating basically continuously since they moved into Londolozi. And I think they've come up here because of pressure from the west, from the Majingalan coalition. So for those of you who are new viewers and have never heard of the Matimba males, well, that <laughs> elephant digs alternatively and puts his bottom in his friend's face. The Matimbas used to be the dominant coalition of this area. And they were chased off by the Birminghams almost exactly a year ago. This is fantastic. Isn't this great? Just brilliant stuff. And they're talking to each other continuously, you know. I don't know if you can hear that. Definitely a little bit of consternation in the herd. They're talking amongst themselves. Or maybe just chatting. Maybe they're not, there's no consternation at all. They're probably just having a chat with each other. And this is just typical play behavior. Males normally will engage in it. It's so interesting how the females, exactly, exactly the same as with human beings. The female, I suspect not only elephants, it's just obvious with elephants, probably with many species. The males are far more likely to engage in the sort of physical horseplay than the females are. The little cows just kind of get on with it and they are often close to each other and you see them putting their trunks in each other's mouths and just kind of being affectionate. But this kind of um, a rambunctious behavior, which is so typical of male human beings, 
so too is it typical of elephants, young bulls. We're quite close to this one now. He's only about 20 metres from us. He's also a youngish bull, probably about 18 years. Letting it all hang out there, Vim. I'm always amazed that there aren't great big cuts and bruises on their faces. I mean, those tusks are powerful. This is just fantastic. Isn't this amazing? Fantastic stuff. I'm just going to sneak forward a little bit so that we can watch them having a bit of a box. So that they're out of the way of the bushes. Look, one of them on his knees there. <laughs> and Nemo, you say elephant yoga in the morning. Yes, it does very much look like elephant yoga, doesn't it? I absolutely agree. figure out exactly where I am. Quickly call it in. Stays into the breeding out of elephants from static feeding at the junction of Arathusa Airstrip Drive, at least Arathusa Driveway and Eli Alley. It does help, of course, if you turn the radio on when you make that announcement. Stations is a breeding herd of elephants at Junction Eli Ali Safari uh, Driveway. Static feeding. There we go. Look at that. This is just too fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. And I mean look at this look how sharp their tusks are. Look how heavy they are themselves and how they don't absolutely destroy each other by this horse kind of horseplay. I don't know. I mean the force with which they're bashing into each other is is incredible. And Jen B, you say, can you see bruises on elephants? Now, I suppose that's a very good question, given that I say they don't seem to injure themselves. Um, Jen, I don't think you. Yeah, I'm sure you could, but I don't think that they they necessarily get tremendous bruising but I don't think it'd be obvious so yes they probably are bruised every so often by this kind of thing but yeah you're right we wouldn't see it as much but it's not so much the bruising as it would be the gaping wounds I think that would you know emerge as a result of those tusks crashing into the, each other's faces Here we go again, thwack with the trunk. <laughs> and the little one, 
Oh, that's very interesting why he's backing into his mate like that. There's another little one just to the left of us. You may have heard it going... <laughs> just a bit bored of eating trees all day long. And he's eating a red thorn tree there. I'm going to sneak a bit forward so we can have a better look at him. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Soraya and Dr. Rob, you're in New Jersey and you say, is it true that elephant dung is a delicacy? Not to anyone I've ever met, Soraya. So, Soraya and Dr. Rob, no, I don't think elephant is, dung is a delicacy to anyone. Viem, have you ever heard that? No. No. So I don't think so, Dr. Ron. I think elephant dung remains what it is to everybody else, and that is dung. Now that butt bashing you heard is one of the youngsters here, just rushing into the bushes. I think they may have given up having a fight now. And they're a bit hungry. Now elephants, of course, have to eat for most of the time that they're alive. And so the time for horseplay is limited. But it is important, just as it is with human beings. It establishes hierarchies, of course, in the same way it helps develop muscles and, and neurological pathways that are absolutely essential to adulthood. In exactly the same way that human play behavior does. This little chap here is actually tremendously confiding. So he gave us an initial little trumpet but now he seems to be very happy. Wouldn't you say, Vim? He's a bit shy. A bit shy. He's probably hiding his face. James Richard, I agree with you. You say you feel like a drive is never complete without some Ellies. I have to agree. I think elephants are certainly the most entertaining to watch. They're always doing something. There's always a, an evaluation of their behavior that can take place. We always learn something new about them when we see them. It is fantastic stuff. You may just be able to hear the sound of the grey luri or the grey go-way bird going wah, wah, all around us. And that will be, uh, they've been doing it a lot lately and I wonder if it isn't some kind of territorial call. Though what they should be being territorial about I'm not really sure. This little fellow is very confiding. And Tammy, you want to know if, if I think that that sort of kneeling down behavior is submissive behavior. It could well be submissive behavior indeed. And I, you know, he, the one that was kneeling down was slightly smaller than the other. But at the same time, you know, I've seen very big bulls doing exactly the same sort of thing. And they've been kind of dominating a fight. So, I don't know, maybe it's just having a bit of a stretch. As we had the comment, maybe it's just elephant yoga in the morning. It could well be. Well, not literally yoga, but it could well be just having a stretch, you know. I mean, carrying this kind of bulk around all day long must be a strain on muscles and ligaments and tendons. And I'm sure that stretching those different parts of the body are crucial there's no when your cat and your dog stand up and stretch it's not just because it feels nice it feels nice for a very good reason it's to get the blood moving through the muscles to make sure that when if sort of um, 
fast activity is required. The muscles are sufficiently oxygenated and the blood is flowing at sufficient speed. So uh, there's one gwari bush, which is the bush that the elephant is eating behind, is the only thing in the, between us. Let's just go. Mm. He's really got behind the only piece of tiny scraggly vegetation that he could have. I'm going to sneak forward slightly, but I don't want to disturb him. They're very calm. And Christopher, you were watching a few days ago and we had an injured baby elephant and you say, does anyone know what happened to it, what its fate was? Christopher, I don't, but it's definitely too soon to say. I'm 99% sure that you'll find that elephant is with its herd now. So, yeah, it'll be absolutely fine, I imagine. But, uh, it, you know, for those of you who weren't watching, we had this elephant who has a very nasty kind of um, limp on the front right leg it was. A young elephant, probably less than a year old and it's very difficult to know what will happen. The herd will protect her, her or him for a lengthy period, but if it comes to the stage that that injury doesn't heal and the herd starts to be affected, more than sort of a few individuals within the herd start to be affected by the fact that it, the herd can't move to sufficient food and get to water soon enough, they will eventually have no choice but to abandon the youngster. And that, of course, would be very tragically sad, but it could happen. But I think, I think that the foot was swollen at the bottom, which indicated to me that she'd probably stood on something. And, you know, that if, the, if there's an infection in there or if there's a thorn or, um, you know, it'd have to be a pretty substantial thorn, the body will eventually get rid of it. And I suspect quite strongly that the chances are it will heal perfectly. Just giving us a little bit of a head shake there to show us who's boss. Samsung, you say why are so many elephants coming over from Kruger at the moment? Is there better water here? Samsung, I'm not sure that they are necessarily coming over from Kruger at the moment, but there are, do seem to be quite a few elephants around. Absolutely, the water here is better than it is in Kruger. Well, better in that there is more of it. And so, yes, the Sabi Sands does often form something of a sink where elephants will come into an area like this, and especially when it's dry in the winter time. So, yeah, that's a good thought. And, of course, if you start complaining about your big trees being pushed over and the fact that elephants are denuding your vegetation, the quickest way to get rid of them is to close your water points. Let's move a little bit. Do you think this oak nose that he's been left behind? I don't know. I think he's probably just enjoying your attention. Or yeah. oh, he's got a particularly delicious acacia tree that looks like... I mean, given, given the scraggly, its scraggly nature, it does look to me a little bit like it's been eaten by elephants for many, many years. And so maybe, it's, maybe it doesn't produce anything in the way of uh, sort of chemical defense. Maybe there are no tannins in it. Anyway, he's had enough now. <laughs> I think he's going to follow up the rest of the herd now. Let's go and see if we can find those lines, everyone. I haven't heard of anybody calling in or out of that sighting, so maybe there'll be a space for us straight away. We'll have a look and see. Can you see the rest of the elephants through there, Vian? I can see one over there. Thank you. I just wanted you to look there so that I could put my hat on. Mm. <laughs> see you next time. The 
The reason that is necessary, everybody, for those of you perhaps new viewers, um, I have a very, very shiny ball top to the top of my head, uh, which will blind you in the early morning light, and so I have to change my hat off screen. Right, Brent Leo Smith is on Cheetah Plains. I have no doubt that if there is a cheetah on Cheetah Plains, he will find it. Let's go and find out from him. So we've just arrived in the far east of our traverse, and uh, thank you to James Henry for the kind words. And we did have cheetah tracks yesterday down here, but unfortunately they went into the Kruger. But if they've gone out, they've got to come back at some point. Uh, bad news about that incredible sighting, even though it was at a long distance, you had with Jamie yesterday and the one sticks cub and female. They have headed to the west, so they've actually moved away uh, from Cheetah Plains. We were hoping they might come to the water uh, in front of the lodge, but alas, no luck. But we are going to go see what's happening on the open areas. You can see the elephant's been dragging things around. Let's hopefully, no, we don't catch it. No one's been down this road yet this morning. It's always nice to have a nice fresh canvas to look for tracks. Brian, is, uh, Brian and I were chatting and he's mentioned he's hoping for some ostriches this morning. And we haven't seen them in a while. I, of course, am hoping for an ostrich with a cheetah chasing it. Uh, but we'll only see when we get there. So there's a bit more water down here than there was. So they've started pumping three in a row pan again. So I think we're going to notice a big influx in elephants and zebra. But that's going to be more in the afternoon than in the, the early mornings. Uh, and start moving through sort of from the end of drive uh, through to the sunset. And I think we're going to start seeing some massive herds of also buffalo coming through from the Kruger to take advantage of the water that's here. And of course, always, always hopeful for leopards. But while we continue our search in the far east, James has got an elephant with a short appendage. So just behind this bush, everybody, is an elephant bull. He's probably about 22 or so years old. And his trunk, I just, he's listening to us and I feel, I probably shouldn't, but I feel sorry for him. His, his trunk is probably what, Viam, about a quarter the length it is normally. And he's just listening to us. He obviously feels a bit threatened. When it happened to him, I don't know. He doesn't look like he's in bad condition by any stretch of the imagination. The wound on the end of the trunk doesn't look fresh. So I'm going to guess that he's managed to kind of survive with the injury. And it is astounding to me how an animal that has a strong trunk has such an unbelievable ability to survive here. Now Brent has just confirmed that he has seen this elephant before and that he kneels when he drinks. So he somehow managed to navigate a world where an elephant has evolved trunk specifically because it is so useful to their survival. But this amazing animal has adapted his life to survive without what would seem to be the most important appendage on an elephant's body. Look how he uses his trunk with his mouth and in conjunction with those magnificent tusks that he's got. The tusks are very shiny. They look like they're tremendously well kept, to be honest. He just looks a little depressed, doesn't he, Viam? I mean, he could have been like this since he was tiny. It's very difficult to say, but like I say, he doesn't look like he's in any kind of distress, condition-wise. It's just me being uh, sort of anthropomorphic by saying shame. I feel sorry for him. Look how he uses his tusks there. And he takes, I think he takes bigger branches so that he doesn't, because the trunk doesn't actually reach the mouth. See that? And so he takes bigger branches and feeds them up into his mouth and then probably uses his tongue quite extensively.
Gosh, that's not easy. I don't think that that's recent. I think that's old. And I think it, I'll tell you why I think it's old. I think it's probably from a poacher's snare that that's happened. And I think that an adult elephant wouldn't have picked up a snare at that level on his trunk. Although, I don't know. But he looks pretty experienced with it, and it doesn't look like a fresh wound, so I'm going to say it's happened many years ago. That would have made him very, very vulnerable until he, you know, except that he would have had the protection of the herd, I suppose. See, now he's put his whole mouth over the top of the tree. Isn't that interesting? And he'll just be tagging along kind of behind that herd that we were watching, staying within sort of audio contact and olfactory contact, so he'll be able to smell them and he'll certainly be able to hear those rumbles which travel a great distance through bush like this. But he'll stay on the fringes because he's now a big adult. And Jen B, you make the slightly apocryphal joke. You say, say his trunk is truncated. Well, indeed, it is very truncated, Jen B, by about 75%, I think. Maybe not quite that much. At least 60%, though. And Marie, you want to know if I think the tusks on him might grow longer. Uh, given the state of his trunk, no, I don't. I think the length of his tusks is an entirely genetic thing. I don't think there's any kind of environmental response. Well, save for the f a nutritional one. So if an elephant has bad, poor nutrition, then obviously its tusks will not grow to their genetic potential. But I don't think he will respond to environmental strain from the lack of that tusk by making longer tusk uh, trunk, but by making longer tusks. He's giving us a bit of a head shake there, saying that we shouldn't be saying bad things about him, but he's actually just fine. And interestingly, just look below him there. If you, um, if you look at his feet, sorry, you can see steam rising off the ground. Now, I think that's coming from the drips that come out of his nose there. His nose, his nose drips continuously. I'm not going to start the engine. We are, again, I've managed to get us behind a bush. But he's just checking us out, so let's just give him some time and just see how he responds to us. He will be smelling us. That trunk will be kind of facing forwards every so often. It lifts towards us. And there's a very slight breeze blowing from what is basically behind us towards him. So he can smell Viam's aftershave. Way after shave. <laughs> I look like I'm shaving. That's a good point. Fiam doesn't shave, of course. <laughs> Unbelievable. Animals are so incredibly resilient. Off he goes. He's in, he's in very good condition, everyone. He's absolutely fine. He's not in poor condition in, in, by, in, by any stretch. And you can just see little jets of steam coming out of his nose. I don't know if you noticed that. I suppose, you know, in most elephants, there would be, there would be quite a lot of moisture, but it would get blown out every so often, and it wouldn't drip continuously like that. Brilliant. Okay, still trying to get to those lions. We're not far, so let's head that way and see if we can't pick them up. You happy to go to the lions, Bill? You do like cats, don't you? Mm. Yes. All right, while we do that, let's go back to Leo Smith and see what he's got on Cheetah Plains. So we're just checking the water around three in a row pan. There's 
not much happening here. It looks like there was an, a massive amount of elephants over overnight. And what you find with Ellie's is they're normally going to drink when it's a bit warmer or during the night. You don't really find them around the water in the early morning. Uh, you can, but it's, it's, it's slightly less usual. So we're going to now head to the northern boundary of our traverse here on Cheetah Plains and we're going to head east towards the Kruger National Park and I always get slightly excited when I come here because you have that mass of the Kruger and you never know what's going to come out of that massive area and I mean we were lucky enough to see a pangolin there so you never know what could be out there and of course I always have to have a look for Nkanyanini, the female leopard in this area. So, Nathan's wondering how common acacia trees are in the area. Well, where we are right this very second, there's a few around. There's some red thorns, and there they are there. But generally in the Sabi Sands, we deal mostly with what we call broad-leafed woodland, which made up mostly of terminalia or cluster leaf and combretum or bush willow. That's why we don't have huge amounts of giraffe. We do have quite a few acacia species, but we don't have that many and they only grow in certain places. So around here on this seep line we've got a few, but in other places we don't see too many of them. So they prefer slightly more clay soils than the, than the combretums, who like sand and quartzite soils. And there are a few around, and Nathan, uh, I do like a good acacia, and although we're not supposed to call them acacias anymore because of the Aussies, and I think we've got a few Aussies watching, uh, good morning Mr. Turner, and uh, others from the Taronga Zoo, and uh, so the Australians, being Australian, uh, had a little thing about acacia trees, and I think we're supposed to call I don't even remember what we're supposed to call our acacias now, but I still call them acacias. So it's quite interesting. So Australia petitioned the naming of whoever names the different species that acacias should only be in Australia. Now, which is quite amusing because the first acacia described was from Africa. And somehow the Australians won. I'm trying to remember what we're supposed to call acacias now. And Probably a good thing I can't remember because I, I don't think I'm going to change. So uh, why don't you guys let me know what are we supposed to call acacias in Africa? And if you know that answer, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So it seems like James has had all the sightings luck this morning and I'm hoping as we move towards uh, the open areas on the east and southern side of Cheetah Plains where the reserve gets its name from uh, we might have a little bit of luck and also I haven't done a nearly impossible tree quiz in a while so I'm going to be looking out for a nearly impossible tree for you to identify. The other really wonderful thing about this part of our traverse area is we get those big groups of elephant bulls coming in from the Kruger and it's not uncommon to see three to seven big, big bulls together. Uh, the station on Nkoro, do you copy? I've heard something going on near the open area here, but I'm not sure what it is. And unfortunately, I was quite far on the radio and they don't seem to be hearing me too well. And there's a little antelope we did speak about. Oh, he's going to do it disappearing here. Yeah? You got him there, Brian? Oh, no, he's off at a rate of knots, as sometimes Stenbalk do. Well, 
Let's see, it says Acacia is now called Vil v Vachilia. Now that just sounds ridiculous to me. I'm sticking with Acacia. Maybe we should start a hashtag campaign. Acacia, hashtag Acacias for Africa. That would get the scientific fraternity in a bit of a fuzz. And Lissa says the acacias in Arizona are still called acacias. Here we go, we've got a female kudu. And if you look carefully, if you see one kudu, there's normally a couple other around. And they are, they are off to the left in the, in the bush. Oh, a little great jacket jumped through the back end of screen there. Let's try to get a bit closer to these kudu. looking quite alert and that's a kudu's general state. Sub adult there. These beautiful big ears. It's always fascinating if you spend a bit of time watching them. Watch how their ears rotate and move around trying to pick up on any sound and when they focus in on something you can see how they point their ears forward towards the sound just to check that it's not something sneaking up on them. And you can see there's a juvenile red-billed oxpecker combing through the fur. Looking for any ectoparasites. Mostly ticks. They will feed off other parasites. And just watch how carefully they move. Kudu quite often are found in relatively thick woodland. So those big ears are their very, very, very important in terms of their survival. And if they do spot a predator, they let out an almighty bark, very deep and gruff. But I don't think there's anything stalking them just yet. So we'll leave these lovely ladies to their morning munching. Oh, that's just so pretty. Oh, she's going to run. So. Now. Living in quite thick areas, as you can see, those ears are made to just move around and listen. Sarah is wondering, which of the antelope species have the best luck evading capture? Now, Sarah, I would say they've probably all got equal chances, and they've all got fascinating different uh, sort of uh, defense systems that they use to avoid predators. And uh, the little Steenbok or Dyker, the smallest of them, uh, they often keep dead still, so most animals out here and predators included, their eyes are designed to pick up movement. So movement's what engages them. Where there's, and the same for the, uh, the, the prey species. If they see movement, they'll double check, make sure it's not uh, any danger. And now, the interesting thing is if, if, if you walk a lot in the bush, you can quite often get quite close to impala and kudu on foot if you don't sneak around. So the same way when they spot a leopard or a lion, it gives up and they alarm call at it. And the, the leopard sort of puts its tail up and says, oh, I'm not going to catch these guys and off they go. So if you try to sneak around like you're pretending to hunt, you often find that the, the animals will run away. But if you just sort of walk like you're not doing anything across an open area, they'll move off, but they won't disappear at a rate of knots. So we're about to emerge onto the first of the big open areas. And we've had some luck here with leopard and lion. 
I'm still waiting to see the first hyena on the cheetah plans. I have not seen a hyena here yet. Okay. We've got some impala. Oh! And it looks like a nice herd of buffalo drinking, so let's just shoot over there. Mike, Mike. So Betty's saying she's yet to see baby warthogs or baby wild dogs. Are we coming up? Mike, may I join you with those nyari? Mike, uh, how many stations with that Columbia of nyari? Sorry, Betty. Copy, thanks. So we're just talking about how these big herds of animals are going to start coming through for the water. We've got this big herd of buffer. It looks like a couple of hundred. And I think we're just going to wait here as they march towards us. Let's give Brian a, a window. I do love these big herds of buffalo. Betty, I haven't forgotten you. I will answer your question, but let's look at these buffalo first. Look at that. So they've finished drinking, and big herds of buffalo generally like to drink twice a day, once in the early morning, once in the evening. And we're going to start seeing these buffalo show, showing signs of a fatigue and a bit of sort of hips showing as we head deeper into the drought. And they have to move bigger distances between food and water. Difficult to say how many, but I'm probably going to guess two to three hundred. Uh, we're still quite far, so we can't see all of them. You see there's some zebras behind them waiting their turn at the water hole. Look at that. Isn't that fascinating? Now, they're going to probably pop up right next to us. Oh, there might be a few more than I thought. Might be the second biggest herd I've seen this dry season. The biggest herd was at Sydney's waterhole, and they were easy over 500 there. Now, we often, well, I often like to talk about the original colonial collective nouns for animals, and, and buffalo has got one of my favorites. It's an indomitability of buffalo. And when you see them walking at you en masse like that, you can see why. So there's, there's the front of the... And as normally a couple of the dominant bulls and, and, and sometimes even an older female leading, which is happening in this case. So they're going to be having a tough time of it over the over this drought period. And let's just get back a bit. Let's try and get from front to back all in the same shot.
Okay, so we're just trying to get into a position and hopefully we're going to be engulfed by buffalo. There we go. So, as these buffalo move towards us, this is quite a wonderful photographic opportunity, so get your screenshots ready. I'm going to pop a few photographs as well. And share your screenshots with us on our Facebook page, Safari Live, or pop them on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. Brrr. Now, Angel Lady saying she's seen baby lions, baby leopard, baby elephant all play, but she's never seen baby buffalo play. Do they ever do that? They do, but not as commonly, and also, not. I think there's going to be very little playfulness this year. I think there's also going to be quite a high mortality rate for the calves this year uh, because of the drought. It's always the old and the young to go first. Brian, is that female that stopped to look at us? Just have a look at her eye there quickly. It looked like there was something funny happening on her face. A little bit to the left. That one, I, know, I think it was just the way the light was shining. So I'm looking for young calves and I'm not seeing too many so far. I've seen quite a few sub-adults, uh, but no young, young babies, which is unusual in a big herd of buffalo because they do breed throughout the year. So they don't have a set breeding season. Now, keep looking, you might see a little one between the legs of the others. Some of them stopping to give us a sniff as they go past. Oh, there's a nice big dominant bull there, and he's showing a bit of interest in that female to the right, but so, and he's just behind this female, and he looked like he was going to try get a bit frisky, and wait, you'll see his head pop out shortly, and you can see he's a monster. Now there's a really lovely comparison between male and female buffalo. Uh, as he turns his head, you see that massive boss and that hardened layer of hair that makes up the horns of the animals and the female next to him, she doesn't have that developed boss. You can also see the body size difference between a big male in his prime and, and a cow. Oh, having a little canter past us. I think initially I said, oh, I still think 300... 350, but still no very small babies. Now, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sean says the buffalo remind him of rush hour every morning while he's trying to get to the train. Well, this is our sort of morning traffic jam, and it's definitely a traffic jam of choice for me. So still no young babies. Now, that's very, very interesting, especially in a herd this size. We'd ex expected to see at least a couple. Oh, there you go. Found a nice, convenient scratching post. You can hear the oxpeckers chirping about as well. Now, it's always good to check on these big herds of buffalo, you do find yellow-billed oxpeckers sometimes. They're slightly more rare than the red bull, but we have been seeing them quite frequently. And now the buffalo are literally parting around us. Another one of the bulls. It's still not a young calf. And look, there's some zebra coming in behind. Oh, 
Brian, how many do you think? Oh, over a hundred easily. Uh, I'm definitely thinking probably around 300, 350 maybe. So I think the second biggest herd of buffalo we've seen this year, this dry season. This and they're still coming. <laughs> Snorting. I love the sounds a buffalo herd makes. <laughs> so these are the youngest ones I've seen so far, and they're by no means nipper, uh, whipper snappers. But now, if you watch a buffalo herd carefully. They've got a very interesting strategy. They're one of the only bovids that are able to, the babies are able to drink on the move. They actually walk between the mom's back legs, uh, drinking while they move. And of course, it enables them to, f to, to feed while the herd is on the move. And these big herds of buffalo are quite constantly on the move. Some of them are a bit nervous. Now the biggest herd of buffalo I've ever seen in the Sabi Sands is around a thousand. But these buffalo are heading off uh, towards our northern boundary, so we're going to let them go and hopefully we can find a lion on their trail. But while we do that, James has got something reptilian to show you. Right, everybody, here we are. We're at basically the area where the two Matimbas have killed their buffalo. We're not far from them, we think. They're in the shade here somewhere. The kill is just up ahead. I unfortunately cannot move, though, while we are live. That is the biggest water monitor lizard I've ever seen. And so we're just going to sit around here for a little while and see if we can't spot the lions. We'll go sort of will reverse around and apparently they're on the northern side of this fairly substantial drainage line and we'll go and see if we can't find them. Anyway, so that's the update there. That is by far the biggest water monitor lizard I've ever seen. Liam, you? I think it's possible he ate the lions. I think it, he might have eaten the lions actually. Right, let's, we're going to try and move everyone, we'll see if it's possible. Um, if you do go black screen, poor old Brent is going to be live again in short order. I'll quickly try and show you the kill, but I think as we move you're going to lose us. There we go, we're about to leave and then we just decided to stay a little bit longer as the last sort of dregs of the herd come through and also there's a very nice little harem of zebra just behind them. So at the back of the herd we start seeing, although they're not in too bad a shape yet, I mean, in that initial drought we had some very skinny looking buffalo, but they're not too bad, there we go. Two bulk grazers together. Mm. So, Sandy's been listening to us talk about how hard the drought's going to be. So, I just want to show you the back end of this herd, the dust they're creating. 
as they walk away from us. So Sandy is saying, well, if there's water and these pumped water holes, why is it so hard during the drought? Well, Sandy, an animal like a buffalo weighs around a thousand pounds, give or take. So it's a very big animal, therefore it needs to eat quite a lot to keep that size. And as you can see, as these buffalo walk through here, there's very little to eat. So even if there is water, there's almost no grass this season. And even that late little rain that gave a, a little flush of grass was not ideal. Because if we even go taste what are normally really sweet grasses, really good grasses, they had very little time and, and the rain came right at the end of their growing season. So those grasses are holding very little nutrients, the, the few that are left. I mean, here we go, look at that. That's what I wanted to show you. There's about three to four hundred bottoms in a row. You can see the dust created by a herd like this. Now, in certain parts of Africa, the way you find buffalo is by looking for big clouds of dust and also always a good way to find a lion. So, uh, as I said, we didn't see one tiny little calf in this herd. And Sally's wondering, will the drought affect the amount of babies born? Probably not the amount, Sally, but definitely the, the survival rate. So, one of the biggest problems that the females will have during a time of drought like this is uh, milk production. So, even if they give birth to a, a healthy-ish young buffalo, they're unable to feed it. And also you might find there might be quite a few stillborns uh, if the, the females are not in good condition when they do give birth or sort of very runty buffalo that are going to have trouble surviving. And even then because those babies are born and the females milk production is probably not so good, those buffalo, baby buffalo the first ones the lions grab. So now they're marching to the northeast. So in that direction, they're heading towards the Gabbro Plains of the Western Kruger National Park. So there's likely to be more grass there, but there's no water. So they've got to do this long trek between water and food. And that also obviously affects condition. Oh, it's just a, it's a spectacular sight. And we've caused a bit of a traffic jam behind us. So we're going to leave them be, see what else we can find out here in the east. Now I'm going to go do a little dabble to the red soil road that I, I really like because it's where we find the dominant female leopard in this area most often. Kanyanini. So of course any chance of seeing tracks here have been obliterated, but don't worry, we're going to head further to the east. Chatting about leopards, uh, Kelly in Florida is wondering, will female or related female leopards ever work together to successfully raise their cubs? Now, as a general rule, absolutely not. But there has been one very, very strange incident that has been recorded in the Sabi Sands, and I happen to be lucky enough to witness it. Uh, it was probably now oof, 10, 10, 11 years ago and 
It was the first recorded case of leopard adoption ever. So our dominant female in the center of Londolosi was called the 3-4 female. And her daughter, the Dudley Riverbank female, used to be slightly more to the, the east. And they happened to have a boundary, very similar boundary to sort of what Karula and Shadow share here. And they both had cubs at the time. And the Dudley Riverbank female had two cubs. Two males at the time were about five months, five and a half months old. And uh, three, four female had one cub who was a bit younger. So they happened to bypass and the one cub stayed with his grandmother and his uncle, even though he was younger than him, and actually outcompeted the, the, the older female's cub that had died and ended up staying with his grandmother till, till independence. And that is the first and only ever case of uh, leopard adoption uh, that we know of. And of course, we, stuff like this might happen in areas that, that we don't traverse often and we might not know what happens there. But as, as we do spend a lot of time with leopards and the fact that it's only been seen once, you probably find it is a very, very rare occurrence. There's even a big scientific paper on it. Always like to check carefully in this area. It doesn't look like there are any tracks today. She might still be in the Kruger. She does sometimes like to leave her cubs on this termite mound here. So we just got to get through this little dip here where our comms are very bad um, and I'm just, it'll take me about two minutes to get to a spot where I'll be able to hear again. And I think we've got quite an interesting question from, I think it's Ran or Ram, but just let me get a little bit higher and uh, I'll, I'll be able to hear it. Okay, we should have our comms back now. We're out of that little dip. This is the area where the cheetah crossed into Kruger yesterday, or from what you can see of the tracks. Ram would like to know whether leopards know that vehicles have people in them or, or which animals might identify vehicles with people. Now, this is quite an interesting one because quite a few of us differ on, on whether the leopards know the vehicles have people and I think everyone's got their own opinion. I personally don't think they know and the pure reason for that is if they knew, they would behave very similar to the way they do on foot. So they would move away from you or try to hide from you. But in the vehicle, you can get very close to them. Uh, it doesn't smell like a person, it doesn't look like a person, it doesn't, and for them, I mean, it smells of petrol and oil and all those other terrible things. So I don't think they, they, they realize there's people in the vehicles. And that's just judging from their behavior to a vehicle as opposed to how they behave to you on foot. And I'd have to say the same for most animals. I think probably an animal that does know that there's a, a person in the vehicle are the, are the two primates. I would say the baboon and vervet monkey, but far more interesting, James has got something big and hairy and scary to show you. 
Everyone, this is just so wonderful. We're here, I mean, it's been a real trial getting into this area and to try and find you some signal. But here are the Matimba males. That is the uh, red-headed one we had, red-headed one, Blondie, I think you called him. And his black-maned brother is close by too. And they've, I mean, they've left their, their kill. I don't really understand why they would have. And they do seem to be in very good condition. They're fat, they're looking strong. They are substantially larger than the Birmingham boys. Really, I mean, they're a lot bigger. And now they've left their kill. I think they I mean, they've either decided that they've sired sufficient cubs for them to be sort of satisfied with their lives. And here's the other one. This is a proper male lion. Look at him. Isn't he fantastic? I'm just going to quickly tell them that I've found them again. They are relocated just to the north of the power lines. Uh, good visual here. A affirmative. They came towards power lines. They're now just off power lines. One of them is static. Isn't that lovely? And in excellent condition, you can see not thin at all. They're fat, and they're not just fat from eating. I mean, they're fat from months and months of good eating. Full maned, full big black mane this fellow has. Yeah, if, um, now, Colleen, you're in Minnesota and you want to know how long a coalition of males survives. Well, it'll survive until one of them dies. Look at his hair. His name, that's why you called him Hairy Belly, of course. He's got hair on his, got, his beard extends almost like a Barbary lion down to the belly. Let's follow them. Unusual that they're moving, unusual that they've left the kill, unusual that lions in such incredible condition are seemingly without territory. They're almost nomadic, which is bizarre. And Blondie, I think, was he called Blondie? What did they call him? Ginger. Ginger. Uh, it was Ginger and Hairy Belly. So Ginger has still got the same wound, that same weeping wound that he's always had on his right foot. It's still weeping. It's still raw and red, but it, you know, doesn't seem to affect him. So I don't know, maybe these fellows have just decided that it's too hard, there are too many males around, and they're just going to live out their lives as bachelors and not fight for territory. And maybe that's, I mean, from their point of view, it's f***ing. They're in excellent shape. From an evolutionary point of view, it's an F. But I've got to tell you, they're a lot more conscious of the vehicles than I've ever seen them before. And they certainly have been, I wouldn't say running away from us, but every time we come near them, they do look up. They were on the move. There they are. I'll just, sorry, let me try and get into a decent position. We'll get you, get you a one shot of both of them then. You can see the different colors. I'm sure some of you have never met these chaps before. And you can see the luscious locks of the black mane there of Hairy Belly and the slightly less luscious locks of his brother Ginger. Now, what I would really like to see, Junior has been around here. I would love to see them meet up with him. That would be fascinating. So, I mean, you saw there, just watch your head there, Vimpy. You saw there, everyone, how they looked up at us or he, the black man, looked up at us. You know, these lions don't normally do that. They normally don't, I mean, you can almost run them over before they'll react to you. A couple of other vehicles coming in here. But that's okay. I'll try and get you a shot of both of them. 
that the elephants have continued to make an astonishing amount of mess in the general vicinity. Let me go around this little bush here and we'll get a good view. The big stump. Ninzane Kualan. Ah, ah, it's just yeah, not me. Yeah, too worn, too worn. So he's just saying there that they, they have. I'm going to stop here. They're reacting to the vehicles, you know. They're absolutely reacting to the vehicles, and he was just saying here that. He has seen them give a little bit of a charge once or twice to the cars. And I think that was probably earlier this morning. Now that is completely bizarre behavior for these two lions. We know them well. We know that they didn't used to do that at all. And it is purely a fact or function of the fact that they are threatened, that they don't have a territory, they're not confident anymore. Let's just watch this here. See how he's moving. Trying to get away from the cars. It's so unusual to have to treat lions with kid gloves like this. There you can see on his foot, you can see that little wound still there. He's not limping at all. It's so odd. Hey, Jim. I'm just, I'll just reverse a little bit. I'm not going to go any closer to them. Into that gap. Okay. Yeah, I'm just picking the correct spot for us to get a decent view. I find this absolutely astounding. And I know that many of you are extremely excited to see these chaps again. I am too. I don't think they'll be around for long. But here they are. Is that right? Now, the next time you see the Birmingham boys, and the next time you're impressed by their size and by the fullness of their manes, just cast your mind back to the sighting that we've had here. These two males, I would say, are about 20% heavier than those two Birmingham fellows. Their manes, certainly the black manes, manes are far fuller, which indicates in theory that they are much more filled with testosterone. These are two big male lions, and they're of course the sires to Junior. Junior is a very big fellow, is going to be a very big fellow. I'm assuming it's the black man that is um, Junior's, Junior's father, just given that he seems to be the more dominant of the two. But it could be the Ginger. Well, the Chitra Chitra chap has gone quite close to them now, and they seem to be completely relaxed about it. This is what lions do now. I'm sorry that, I mean, Viam and I watched them from quite a while before you got to us, and that's simply because we just didn't have any signal down in the deep drainage line there. But I'm sorry that you didn't get to see them moving around a bit more. I think they will probably remain where they are now for the rest of the day. Hello, crazy critter. That's a nice Twitter handle. You say, will the darker mane make a difference to their, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to their mating success? Yes, absolutely, it will. Simply because they have more testosterone and therefore they're more willing to fight for the opportunity to mate. They tend to be more, I hate to use the term aggressive, but yeah, I mean, they do tend to be more aggressive with each other.
We'll try and go a little bit closer now. Just now that they seem to have settled down. I'm sure we can get in a little bit closer, have a look at both of them. And we'll just do a little twist around here, try not to make too much noise. Christy, you want to know if I think they will hurt Junior? No, I don't think they would. I think they'd recognize him as their own offspring. Um, it's not unusual for very old male lions to set up kind of a, to set up a, a coalition with younger lions. These guys are without a territory. Their son is without a territory. Their son might want a territory. And so, you know, it's not entirely unlikely or impossible that they should form a coalition with him. We don't really want that to happen in this area because as we know the Birmingham's have set themselves up they've got cubs and we don't want that whole process to be sort of undone now, now they're acting like the timbers we know which is basically to just look magnificent and not do very much straight at them, but we'll just do it slowly. How's that for you, Ben? Eyeball, I tell you. Now they say you shouldn't look a lion in the eye. Well, I'm looking him straight in the eye now. Now, Sally, you're in Oregon and you say you've never seen them before. You're a newcomer and you say you can definitely see the difference. Yeah. It is amazing. Yeah, they're watching, eyes open. Hmm? In? Yeah, Nyam. Hile Pagaj in Kove Nili. He look cool, eh? About 250 meters. Yeah, he look cool. Okay. Um, Mara, look, uta wona mingko onzo. Yeah, yeah, mo mingen ale power line metai kome. Yeah, he is mingen ale. Yeah. Just quickly giving him an indication as to where the kill is. And a question about whether another rumble in the jungle could be in the offing. Could we see another sort of counter territory takeover? And that's Sean who's wondering that. Sean. I think it's highly unlikely. I don't know why they would have left. And of course, the Birminghams now are established. They're bigger, certainly, than they were when they took over the territory. These two guys actually didn't. I'm not sure that they ever set sight on the Birminghams. They heard them calling and they got up one morning, almost exactly a year ago, and disappeared. So I don't think that the two of them would take on the four Birminghams, no. There's something about those eyes, though, that is slightly unnerving. And that's simply because they're unusually open. Male lion's eyes, normally when we watched these two before, you just find them fast asleep. Those eyes would not be looking at us. They'd be fast asleep. And I'm pretty sure that that will be the case again. Just moving very slowly in my seat. You can just see him flicking his tail a little bit. 
you say? No, it's not for interference. I'm afraid it's not my phone. I'm sure it was from the other vehicle. Yeah. Now he seems to be going to sleep. There was just a little bit of tail flicking, and there are no flies around at the moment. And of course, a lion, in exactly the same way as a house cat will, will flick its tail when it's about to attack something. Now, he's not about to attack, but he's still watching us very carefully. Very unusual. Very indicative of a lion that's been threatened by the lack of a territory. Now, sale, very valid question, how old are they? Well, as far as I was aware, they were 10 about a year ago, so they must be about 11 now. They look like about 11, 10 or 11-year-old male lions. So I would go with about 10. There were four of them. And they took over the territory as four, and then two of them sort of skedaddled off into Kruger and in north of the Manuleti, and they split up their territory, and it's sort of since been, I mean, separated, if you like, by the territory of the Salati males in Buffalo's Hook. And they didn't come together again. And this is, of course, I think, why the tenure out here was never that great. The Majingalan coalition, who've been the dominant Western coalition of the Sabi Sands now, I think for about four years, have always come together when there's trouble. As soon as there's, you know, they've, they have split up every so often, and they kind of keep two to one side and two to the other. But when there's trouble, they all come together, and that did not happen in the case of the Matimbas. Now they are sleeping soundly. Margaret, do you want to know if that's dirt or ticks on his belly? Um, let me just get, I, th I think it's flies, actually. Let me just get my binoculars out. Uh, just flies, Margaret. At this stage, I'm sure there are one or two ticks there, especially in that thick mat of hair that he has down by the fat end of his belly. I say they're in good condition, which they are, but they're also very fat after eating their buffalo. I'm just so interested as to why they would have left it, why they'd moved away. Oh, and Viem, we can probably get quite a good view there of his, um, not his belly so much, but his wound on the other foot. You see it there? There you can see that wound, everyone, that's been there forever and ever. As far as I'm aware, I've never seen him without it. Do you think you've actually lost his dew claw? Because that was the... That may well be the case, yeah, actually. Good point. He probably has lost his dew claw. Now, the dew claw is the fifth claw where your thumb would be, they have something called a dew claw, very important for hunting normally. You know, it's the kind of a, it's the clincher. And uh, grab your house cat or your dog and just feel a little bit up towards the carpal joints or towards the wrist joint. And you will feel where that dew claw pops out just below there. Fascinating. And Sally, another one from you. Thank you for your question. You say, do lions breathe so heavily all the time? Uh, no, they don't, but they always breathe that heavily when they are full. And these guys are full of buffalo meat. We were unable to get into a position where we could show you the buffalo and still maintain signal, I'm afraid but they've eaten a huge amount of a young buffalo. 
and that's why they're panting. The stomach is full, they pant to oxygenate the blood around the stomach to make the digestion a bit faster. But they're not panting in the same way. I mean, many lions will be, <laughs> you know, with their bellies as full as these guys are. I'm not sure whether, t I know that there are two Birmingham males on Torchwood today. I don't know where the other two are. It's quite interesting. The day has warmed up rather magnificently. And Chris, you're in South Australia and you want to know if the Majingalan males are older than the Matimbas. Chris, no, I don't. I think that those Majingalans are 12 years old. So I think they're probably a year or two older than these chaps. They might be a quite similar age, but because they've managed to hold their coalition together, so they've managed to maintain territory for longer. They've also been seemingly more willing to fight. Although, you know, I say this, I cast dispersions on our, on our, um, on our lions, and I cast dispersions on their courage. But these guys did actually repel an attack from the Majingalan the other day. And the Jingalan came to Londolozi to try and chase these chaps off, and they left. I don't think there was a physical confrontation. I've got myself into a bad position here because I can't look at the lions and you at the same time. Move the car forward. I can try, but if he chases us, it's going to be your fault, okay? Are you recording? Especially as Wendy is about as quiet and subtle as a charging bull. Eyes. Sorry, we are in a very dodgy signal area here, everyone. Bud, you're in North Carolina, and you ask an interesting question that is going to, of course, affect all the animals out here. Is there a chance that the <laughs> that the drier weather, the drought, will bring in bigger lions? No, Bud, there's no chance of that, I don't think. I mean, any bigger lions that are going to come into the area are going to do so regardless of any drought. You're going to find, I think, that there will be a period of stability because of the drought. Herbivores are going to struggle, which means there's going to be lots for lions and leopards and hyenas and cheetah to eat. And that means that they're not going to be wandering further afield to try and extend their territories because there will be no necessity for that. So I think that you find as the drought persists, so the stability within the predator numbers will be almost absolute. going to take my jersey off so you may hear a little bit of ruffling. Yeah, now you see Paige, I was just thinking the same thing. You're in Tennessee and I, I don't know if you're right or not, but you say could they have moved away from the kill because of the chances of other males pitching up there? Yeah, it's possible. Definitely, I think it's very odd. It's not unusual for lions to move a little bit away from their kills, especially if they want to have a good solid snooze like these two are going to have. But I don't know that it's... Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't think that they would consciously have thought that there was another, um, you know, other male lions in the area, unless maybe there was some roaring around here last night. Maybe it's possible that there was roaring from the other two Birminghams around here last night. 
They're on kind of a fringe area. Now the Birmingham do come this far, but they're almost on the western border of the of the Birmingham Territory and almost into Matimba, at least Majingalan Territory. Majingalans have a massive, massive area. And that's how they these guys have managed to kind of stay under the radar between the two coalition territories. But this is much more like the Matimbas I knew. While they're incredibly magnificent when they're standing up, normally they're doing what they're doing here. We're going to sit here for a few more minutes, but while we sit here, let's go and find out what Brent's been up to. So I'm just checking this western boundary, and I'm just hoping that one sticks lioness brought her cubs this way. But so far, no tracks, and uh, it's been really quiet here on out in the east today. But I haven't forgotten about the nearly impossible tree quiz. And I think I know what tree to do. So, yay. And I have done it before, but it was many, many moons ago. So I'm going to try find one now. So our tree fundies or experts out there, get ready, because it's going to be a tough one. Now, this particular tree I'm, or bush I'm looking for, I'm going to start giving you a few hints about it. It only grows on termite mounds in this area. Oh, hello. We finally found something with a heartbeat, Brian. Oh, see, there's a... How are you there, Brian? Do you want me to go back? So, there's a little breeding herd of elephants here. They're not showing that sort of very relaxed behavior. Oh, there's a tiny one coming. Hello, little one. He's sniffing us. They're not looking too relaxed. They're not going to push them. If they come towards us, that's fine. Look at the little darling. Tiny, tiny, tiny. And then there's a really big cow at the back. And I don't think she trusts us too much, by the way. She gave me a look through the bush. So it is also very thick here. There's a, a very young elephant there. So we're not going to push our luck with them. They are heading towards a slightly more open area. I get up ahead of them. I'm hoping there might be a few more elephants down towards the, the seep line up ahead. But while we manoeuvre around these ellies, hi Sandy. Sandy would like to know whether the bull elephants are pushed out of a herd or do they choose to leave the herd? Well, a bit of both, Sandy. So when they're young boys, sort of in their teens, they are pushed out of the herds by the, the, the females. But once they become adults, they actually choose not to be part of the herd and they only come into those herds normally when they're in must which is a heightened hormonal state uh, and the females in estrus to mate but normally you'll find the bulls spending quite a bit more time out on their own away from the hustle the bustle the screaming of the children and big breeding herds are often very busy lots of shouting pushing females chasing young males males wrestling so the big dominant bulls tend to prefer a slightly quieter life away from all that hustle and bustle. So they are a bit further from the seep line than I initially thought. And I think it might be worth our while going back around towards three in a row pan on our way back to the north, just in case as it's warmed up, the eddies have started making their way there. But first we're gonna finish continuing to check uh, around for the sticks lions in this area but before I forget we were asked about wild dog and warthog babies earlier on the drive and we got sidetracked by that massive herd of buffalo so I'm trying to remember who asked 
the question. I apologize, but at least I remembered. So we are definitely going to answer it for you. I think it was Betty who asked about that. So Betty was wondering, is it the breeding season for them? Why hasn't she seen any wild dog babies or warthog babies? Well, Betty, we're not going to see any small warthog babies till probably November. They have a very set breeding season and they're actually during what they would call their rut. So it's their mating season now, so the babies will only be towards the end of the year. Now, it is the time of the year for wild dog babies. But unfortunately, uh, the two packs that we see uh, are denning elsewhere. The uh, Sands pack is denning in Ottawa, which is on Singita, and the Investec breakaway pack is denning in the Manuleti to the north east of us. So we're probably only going to start seeing dogs regularly uh, after the pups are now able. Ooh, hello. That's a very nice looking lion track. We can see it meandering up the road here. But it does look to be a male to me. And there was a male with the sticks. And interesting enough, I know Mike from Cheetah Plains has driven here this morning, but those tracks are on top of his tracks. So maybe Cheetah Plains will deliver after all. So while we follow these lion tracks, let's go see what hairy belly you're in ginger up to. Hairy belly and ginger are up to not much, to be honest. They're just sitting here doing nothing at all, which is, the, you know, if you're the king of the jungle, then that's what you're able to do. Although these chaps, of course, kings without a throne at the moment. They've just woken up because Roy is just is just repositioning so his guests can get a picture of Ginger here. There you can hear, I don't know if you heard his guest there saying that Ginger is more red. Absolutely, that's why you all called him Ginger. And the black mane, of course, named for that bit of hair on his belly, hairy belly. A bit like me, yeah? Mm. Mm. I've got a hairy belly. Have you? No, I'm a bit more ginger. You're more like ginger. Mm. And you have a slightly ginger beard. Yeah. Mm. Although I've still got all my dew claws. Yes, you've got both your dew claws. And Chris Ray, you make another point, of course, which I'd forgotten about, that hairy belly has got a twitchy face. He does, doesn't he? I haven't seen him doing it today, but he has. Did you? Mm. So, Vyam says he's seen it. Chris Rogue. Let me just move slightly forward. We might be able to see Harry Belly's twitchy face. Say when, Vyam Wonderful to see a lion like this. He's just looking towards the other vehicle. Brilliant stuff. I'll try and get a shot of him, Vim. 
I bet by the time I've managed to organize myself sufficiently, he'll have lined down. Come on, look at me. That's it. Ooh. Full on his eyes. He's a rather splendid fellow, isn't he? And thank you all for your screenshots. Well worth it for a lion like this, aren't they? Fantastic lion he is. He really is, and he's not, uh, I don't even think that he's the most magnificent of the two of them. Just quietly taking in the scene around him. Certainly those heavy eyes are about to shut again. Oh, he's, he's up. Action there. Yeah, and you know, we talk about the effect that we have on animals. That's that there was, I'm afraid, him moving from disturbance. There was no reason for him to move other than the fact that he had two vehicles around him. And that means that their behavior has definitely changed. Because they certainly wouldn't have worried in the slightest when we knew them before. Wouldn't you say, Viem? You think it's unusual that they're moving? Yes. Lions usually don't move at all. No, like they the don't. Sphinx. They're like the Sphinx, exactly. And I suppose many of you, just like Aaron, are seeing these chaps for the first time. And Chris Rogue, there you can see the, the odd facial twitch from our friend, Harry Belly Matimba. That might be because his, his uh, brother's tail is tickling him in the nose. In fact, that's exactly why. I'll just wait for Roy to move out, and then we can move around a bit. I'm not going to... I think I'm going to reverse back a bit. I'll just go forward, basically, to where Roy was. So, Aaron, yeah. First time to see the legendary Matimba males. And, of course, as you say, all of our new viewers will be amazed by the first sighting of them because they've heard so much about the legends of the Matimbas. I'm not sure those legends are necessarily that well founded given how easily they were displaced from their territories. But in terms of poster boys, well, you don't get much more magnificently posterish than these fellows. Let's go around the corner here. Right, while we do this, let's go and find out what Brent's doing and see if he's tracking his... Alas, the tracking has not paid off. Those male lion tracks went west out of our Travis area. Done one last little check past the water uh, at three in a row pan. And we're going to now start heading on one of the only roads we haven't driven on Cheetah Plains today, Ingwe Road. A leopard road, Ingwe is leopard in Shangan, so hopefully it'll live up to its name. And that also is our northern boundary as we head back towards the west. Going to have one last squiz at the last bit of water in front of the Cheetah Plains Lodge, and if nothing, I think we're going to start heading for home. But uh, 
I am a little jealous, but I'm very happy you got to see all those cats with James. And I'm sure he is going to be smiling like a Cheshire cat when we get back to camp. But here we go. I could not find the tree for the nearly impossible tree quiz. Uh, so I'm going to have to do another tree. Well, there was one guess. Was it a jackalberry tree? Unfortunately not. Uh, but we're going to save it for, I think, the sunset safari. But we're going to do another one now. Nearly impossible tree quiz mark two. This one's not ne as nearly impossible as the last nearly impossible tree quiz. It's a little bit easier because I have shown it to you more recently. Now, I'm hoping I can find a pod. And I can. Ha -ha. So there we go. Uh, we only really find them around seep lines. And they never really get big. The elephants keep them quite plump. But this area has got some particularly big ones. And very difficult to get a nice branch for you. There you go. Very tough tree or bush. It's beating me at the moment. Oh no. Oh dear. All right, there we go. There's more of those. Okay. Now I'm sure there's going to be some very fast people who know, know this tree very quickly. So I'm going to pop it on the dash near the seed pods. Now the seed pods are the big giveaway. Okay. There we go. So if you know the answer to what tree this is, pop me an email, questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. I'm scared there are going to be some lightning fast answers this morning. But if we have a look, as I said, the clue is oh, in the seed pod. And the seed pod. I think I'm sitting on my mic. There we go. Is that better? Okay, so the clue is in the seed pod. And it looks like some little creature. But right, we'll leave it at that. So let you ponder what is this nearly impossible tree of the day? The problem is you guys are getting so good that we have to work harder and harder to find a nearly impossible tree. Oh, and as I said so quickly, Joey, aka the monkey man from Australia, uh, is correct. A caterpillar bush or a hairy caterpillar bush. Now, they grow along seep lines. In certain parts of the, uh, of, of the low felt, they're quite rare. And they're quite rare because of their medicinal use. Now, it's quite a funny one. And uh, to be PC, uh, it is the traditional version of the little blue pill. And so, uh, aging gentlemen out in the bush, tend to harvest this uh, little bush uh, to uh, help with their uh, love life. I believe it is. So, the hairy caterpillar bush. And the Latin name is a bit of a mouthful. It's Ponocarpum Ponocarpum Parvum, if I remember correctly. Which I forgot my book this morning, but um, it is Odocarpum Ponocarpum. Well, it could be the other way around. Um, your brain does get tend to get quite full of <laughs> all these different scientific names. And very interesting if we actually move on to scientific names and. Most of the, the newer scientific names uh, are derived from Latin. Uh, the older ones, and sometimes not the older ones, but the others, are quite often derived from ancient Greek. So it's a very interesting combination, obviously mixed in with local languages from areas, uh, as well as uh, regional, regional dialects, uh, and then mixed into Latin. So a very, very interesting thing if you start looking a bit deeper into the scientific names, and, and where the, the history of them come from. I mean, the easier ones, like, like the, the elephant, Loxodonta africanum, uh, long teeth of Africa, and uh, my personal 
favorite is that, of course, the spiral horned, I don't know. So the Trafalagus, which is uh, the spiral horned antelope, that refers to the spirals of the horn. And then Angazi, which is I don't know in Zulu. So that is my personal favorite, the spiral horned, I don't know. And then also sometimes uh, there's a person's name worked in, and that's more common in plants. But if we talk about the spiral horned antelope, we're my favorite family of antelope. Uh, the Sitatunga, which we don't get here, which occurs much further to the north, is a Trafalagus speakii, named after the explorer Speak, who discovered the mountains of the moon and the source of the Nile. So Burton and Speak were the two explorers that found one of the sources of the Nile and also one of the first people to describe Sitatunga. So the sort of scientists of yesteryear, how they used to identify new species was generally at the other end of a shotgun. So they would shoot it and then draw it and, and take pictures, or not take pictures, a lot of them didn't even have that. They would have to sketch out and, and do the anatomy. Fortunately, these days we can shoot with one of these. So if we find a new species, we don't have to kill it to identify it. So I think cheetah planes might be worthwhile on the sunset safari just because I think there's going to be an incredible influx of elephants around those two water holes. So it could be definitely worth coming down but we'll see what's happening in the north when we head back up there. We've just got one last little water hole to check and uh, we should be there in about four minutes. Now, I do love a good explorer story, and I'm going to tell you a few. So, Joey, before we get on to our explorer stories, in Australia, aka Monkey Man, is wondering, is there a chance of seeing Eland on cheetah plants? I have never seen Eland in the Sabi Sands. The closest I've seen Eland here is in the Timbavati. Uh, there's always a chance. Uh, but it's highly unlikely. They do prefer a slightly and oh, you never know. With this drought, it's, it's possible. I mean, we had a, a sable randomly arrive on the Juma Dam Cam at night, and I think we've probably got a better chance of seeing sable during this drought than Eland. But as I said, that is the wonderful thing about being in a 13 million acre open system. You never know what's going to pop up. I'm still hoping for the, uh, the, the first art wolf sighting in the Sabi Sands since 1973. Uh, I think I might uh, do a little jig for joy on the bonnet if we find one of those. So we've got the little Cheetah Plains Lodge pan coming up. There we go. Lovely little open area in front of the Cheetah Plains Lodge brings through quite a few animals. You get lots of nice water buck around here, and of course, occasionally a big cat or three. Alas, this morning there is not even an impala. seems that on this sunrise safari, Commander Bond has been blessed with all the heartbeats and we've had to sort of flatline with a little beat every now and then. So from the small waterhole of Cheetah Plains, let's go have a look at a much bigger one in the far west on Arethusa. Hello everybody, we're just trying to figure out, we're sitting here, we don't know where to look, there are birds everywhere and uh, we haven't just spotted a, a goshawk which we will go back and try and see. I'll just, just run through the species of birds that we have here. There we have a hammerkop or hammerhead. Just beyond him we've got an African jacana or lily trotter. There he is, trotting on the lilies. 
eating little insects and snails probably. Then beyond that, we've got two African spoonbills sweeping their spoon-shaped bills through the water in search, I think, of uh, also small invertebrates. And then beyond them, sitting imperiously, a grey heron. And beyond him, sitting even more imperiously and slightly ominously, a white-backed vulture, which has clearly been uh, up to some kind of eating. And I suspect the white-backed vulture, uh, if it takes off from here, if it's very lucky, it might catch sight of that buffalo carcass. Now, VMP, there's another bird there next to the hippopotamus, and that, of course, is a blacksmith lapwing. I just want to confirm quickly what those spoonbills eat, because I think I may have told you a lie. But it wasn't on purpose, I promise. So there's the blacksmith lapwing. What do you got there? Uh, Egyptian geese. And we had a question yesterday, and I, because my memory is not that fantastic, I forget who it was from, about whether or not or why we are not seeing the barbel or the catfish. And it was simply because, of course, the water at Juma, those dams there, all ran out of water, Biffles Hook and Twin Dams and Juma Dam, they all ran out of water. This has not quite gone dry yet. And in that melee there, in that kind of last dying amount of sort of muddy puddle, we've just seen a great emergence of barbel or catfish. Uh, they seem to have stopped moving completely. The spoonbill, everybody, eats small fish and some invertebrates. So I didn't lie to you, which is a great relief to me. We can go back a little bit and see if we can't spot this gauze hawk, of course, which is a very interesting smaller raptor. Can be how far back do we need to go? Say when. You don't see him, you think he's gone? Anyway, um, I don't want to hang around here for too long, everybody. The Arathusa guests have started their breakfast already, so we're going to leave them in peace. The lodge is just behind us, and let's let them enjoy the sight of the water hole without Veerm and I sitting on top of it. What a wonderful day. Aaron in New Zealand, you say that the Hummer Corp wasn't on your bird list yet. It now is and was number 71. Good. 71 is good. 200 is better, but 71 is excellent. You'll get to 200. Right, we're away from the lodge. Can relax a little bit and marvel at yet another luck-filled drive. Those two male lions, fantastic stuff. Incredible elephant sighting and of course highlight of the day, right as the dawn broke, Karula and her little babies. And then you've also had a huge herd of buffalo with Brent. So all in all, a rather excellent effort for the morning, I'd say. And again, you know, there wasn't any tracking involved today. Just luck. Betty, you say, can we try and find some wild dogs for Brent to chase because he might start chasing squirrels. Well, he's, he was on Cheetah Plains. I think that's where we last saw the wild dogs, although there were. I think those... Torchwood. So they're probably not too far from where Brent is now. Right, my signal's breaking up. Let's go back across to Brent.
So who was saying I was going to chase squirrels? I, I, I'm just giving the other presenters a chance to find things. Uh, Becky, Becky, how naughty of you, Becky. That's rude. Uh, agreed, Brian. Just rude, plain rude, Becky. Well, that's fine. I think for the next few drives, Brian, we're only going to do trees and grass. Oh, there's no grass, so it's only trees. Hooray. Not even a bird. Uh, or we could do soil types. I think soil types, let's not look for animals, let's just do soil types for the next few drives. And maybe I'll chase a squirrel or two. I think I'll catch one, Brian? All right. I don't think I'll catch one, though. Maybe a baby squirrel. But speaking of squirrels, let's look for a squirrel. Now, we will see what is happening. Oh, oh no, 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 no. I know what we should do, Brian. Under that little bush. On the ground, here you got him. Look at that, a beautiful little scarlet tip, a butterfly. So the butterflies are not gonna be around as much during this dry, dry time. But we will have certain species like the scarlet tip that we will see throughout the year. And I think we've got now about over 25 different species of butterfly on camera. We're still pending identification of a couple that seem to have even confused the lep lepidopterists. I've got, sent some photos off. I'm just waiting for confirmation on them. We know that they're part of the blue family, but which one is very difficult. Those little butterflies are extremely difficult to identify. Now, even with sulfur tips and scarlet tips, you can see they can sometimes confuse you because the, oh, off you went. The underside looks orange, so it would lend you to think it's a sulfur tip. But if you look on the inside, it was really nice there because you could see both. The outside, the outside facing part of the wing was that deep scarlet. So, it's always nice to have a look at some of the little things as we go. And as we get going deeper into this, this drought, we're going to see less and less of those little insects. And it's going to be fascinating. I think the first rains this year, we're going to watch this ex place explode into life. Uh, frogs and, and hohos. Now, if you don't know what a hoho is, it's a, it's a sort of local colloquialism for a bug or an insect. And uh, in, our, in my family, strangely enough, it's also a very good name for a dog. So our last Jack Russell was named Hoho, and our current Jack Russell is named Nunu, which is another colloquialism for a little bug. So, and she is a very sweet little Nunu. Uh, our family has never, never been one to name animals sensible names. We've always had quite ridiculous names. We had a, a big dog that was called Skumba which is a Zulu word for skin, because it, when it was a puppy, you could roll the skin over its eyes and make it blind. Um, we had Kubu, which is Tswana for hippo, because when she was a puppy, she used to eat so fast and so much, she used to expand like a little hippo. And, and then I still probably the strangest name of a dog that has ever existed in our family. It, when she arrived as a puppy, she just looked very, very stupid. So we called her Doofus and it stuck. My mother was, of course, horrified. Uh, but Doofus was by far one of my favorite, or definitely my favorite dog over all the years. Beautiful, big, burble. So we might lose you for a second or two, but I'll be up and out through the little, oh, quickly across to James before I lose you. There, everybody, is an African hawk eagle standing resplendently in a tree. And I think its mate, which seems to be a juvenile, is flying just above us, but uh, not viewable with the camera. I can just see him sort of floating off towards the south of where we are now. You're looking due north at the moment at a lazier African hawk eagle. Big bird, probably about a foot and a half long, maybe two, in fact, two feet long, at least. I'm thinking about Franklin's for breakfast. What are you thinking about for breakfast, Fiam? Um, bacon, eggs, mm. maybe a 
some baked beans. Some baked beans. Mm. Well, I'm glad I won't be driving with you this afternoon. It's an open vehicle. It doesn't matter. Sometimes we're still, and the air is still. I'll have to take a picula of the hawk eagle. Obviously, a world-winning shot. Have you had enough? Break, break, break was done. The picula. Uh, VM wants to see my picula picture. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Margaret, you say a five-star day for VM and I. Yeah, we've been so lucky, you know, and it's. It's very tempting, especially when I was a younger guy, to come out and you have a day like this and you think, ah, you know, I know how to do this job, it's easy. Just drive around the corners, you know, your instinct will take you to where the animals are. It's blind, blind luck 95% of the time. And I feel it's important to acknowledge that rather than uh, claim any form of skill at this stage. Very, very lucky we've been. But we'll take it, we'll take it with both hands, because we know that at some stage we're going to be victim to a much quieter day. Not so, Viam. Yes. So we'll take it with, with joy. I also think you should rub it in Brent's face while you have the chance. Well, you see, the point is that there is nobody better at face rubbing than Brent Leo Smith, so you really don't want to get into that space because when he does find or have a good day, ugh, you don't want to be in that space. <laughs> All right, that's going to be it from us, everybody. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thanks for chatting to us and for coming along on what must have been a difficult drive. You know, leopards and elephants and lions and buffalo on cheetah plains must have been a very slow three hours. So thank you for putting up with it while you did. Thank you, Viam, for your efforts today. We'll hand you back to Brent for the last minute of the drive, and I'll see you either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Bye-bye. Now, I think that little last bit from James was a little dig at me because but far from being a quiet morning, James has had leopard cubs, male lions, apparently wonderful elephant sighting. Uh, we did have a really nice big herd of buffalo and some elephants through the leaves, but that's how it goes. And that's why we have two vehicles, Archer, so we can cover more ground and show you the most amazing stuff possible. But I'm definitely going to have to up my game, uh, otherwise I'm never going to be able to walk into camp with my head up held high. And uh, we'll see what happens on the sunset safari. Now, just to let everyone know, we will have a presenter having his trial drive on the sunset safari. So get excited to meet someone new. And uh, I'm just going to leave him as a bit of a mystery. So he'll, I'll leave it for him to tell you all about himself on this evening's sunset safari. And don't worry, none of, none of us, James, Jamie, or I, or Steph, are going anywhere. We're just expanding the team. So we're going to be having a look at a few more people over the next while. So very exciting times. But as we drew towards the end of the sunrise safari, it's been absolutely splendid having you all on the back and I can't wait to do it again in a few short hours. So from Brian, the thumb, and myself, toodaloo, and we will see you just now.